Hey everyone, let's talk about the subject of lumped element matching. So to introduce this subject, um, I'm going to take a slightly different uh, perspective from the textbook. Uh, the, the book just kind of jumps right into it uh, waist deep, where I'm going to tiptoe a little bit just to kind of introduce some of these ideas a little more slowly. So I want you to imagine a transmission line, something like this. And here is a load. I'm going to write this as ZL, and we're feeding it with some characteristic impedance, Z0. And for the sake of argument, let's just suppose my load impedance is Z0 plus some reactants, X sub L. So the real part is matched to my transmission line, uh, but the imaginary part isn't it, right? So more generally, I can say RL plus J X sub L. But in this case, I am going to impose the condition that R sub L is equal to Z naught. So that's why we're writing it this way. So when we talk about lumped element matching, what we're basically saying is what can I insert here at the input to this load to create a matched load, right? Because if I calculate the reflection coefficient, gamma is going to be ZL minus Z naught divided by ZL plus Z naught. And what you'll get is something like, you know, we'll plug this in here. Uh, ZL minus Z naught, I'm going to get an X or, or JXL divided by 2Z naught plus JXL, like that. So there's a mismatch. Somehow I want this reactance to go away. So the phrase lumped element basically just refers to some sort of circuit element being inserted somewhere around this load here, right? So hypothetically, I could put maybe a capacitor here, I could put an inductor here, or I could put an inductor or a capacitor in series. So those are called lumped elements. So is there a way to insert a capacitor and or inductor somewhere, either in series or parallel, such that the equivalent impedance seen looking into this network creates a matched load? So in this case, we've already matched the real part. So you can probably see how it's not that hard to match <clears throat> the opposite, right? So let's start with a simple example of a series uh, element here. So I, it could be a capacitor or an inductor or a resistor, who knows? Uh, but we're going to write it like the following. So I'm gonna just write some JX here for some mysterious element that I'm going to stick here. And then this will be Z sub L, which is again, Z naught plus J X sub L. So this X is not the same as, or, or this X is not to be confused with the X sub L here. Okay, so you'll notice the total series impedance looking in here, Z in is going to be J X plus Z sub L, which will then evaluate to Z naught plus J X plus J X sub L. So if I want to create a match, I want these guys to evaluate to zero. <clears throat> so the natural implication is I need my X to equal negative X sub L. So for the sake of argument, let's suppose X sub L is positive. Okay, so I need a negative reactance here to cancel out this reactance over here. Uh, and so this could hypothetically be an antenna, say, and this is a very common problem where I will have a real and imaginary impedance equivalent looking into this antenna. So maybe my real part is right where it should be, but I need some imaginary bits to cancel out. And you notice they won't dissipate any energy either because they are purely reactive, okay? So if I can somehow get this reactance to negate this reactance here, then we'll be fine. So uh, how do I create a negative reactance? Well, the answer to that is I would just put a capacitor here. Because remember, the impedance of a capacitor is one over J omega C, which you can write as negative J over omega C, which I want that to equal negative XL, or I guess that's technically negative J XL, <clears throat> which then therefore implies, so I'll use my black pen again here, we do a little algebra and I get C is equal to one over omega, oops, sorry, omega, excuse me, the one over omega XL, like that, okay? <clears throat> and likewise, if this was a negative reactance instead, then obviously I would put an inductor here, right? And I would choose the inductance and frequency to match that reactance accordingly. 
So this is the basic essence of a lumped element match, is I'm just inserting some lumped element, <clears throat> some equivalent passive component here around this, uh, this load here to create a nice match of the impedance. Now, obviously this condition of my load being matched to my real is, is not always gonna be feasible, but this is the basic idea. And you can see how you can algebraically solve for capacitance accordingly. Um, but an important thing to do, that, to do with these lumped element matching is think about it in terms of the Smith chart. Okay, so I'm going to draw kind of a, makes, a makeshift Smith chart up here, okay? So one, two, three, four, I'm gonna put right there. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And we'll do our x-axis over here. One, two, three, four, something like this. So here is, well, we'll assume this is my, my unit circle here. Like so. <clears throat> and for a real part that is matched to my, my load here. So let's do it, my normalized impedance. I'm gonna write that as little z sub l is big z sub l over z naught which will evaluate to one plus j times little x l. So a real part of one on my normalized impedance will correspond to this circle here. Okay, so if I add some positive reactants, it has to land somewhere on this circle here. So you'll notice then when I put a capacitor in series, it is going to add a negative reactance. And that is the equivalent basically of moving along this circle. So if I further, if I put an inductor here, that would add more reactance and would push it towards this direction. Or if I add a capacitor, it's negative reactance and it'll want to rotate the other way on my uh, this little circle here. So if I add just enough reactance to cancel out this bit, you'll notice it essentially traverses this arc until it lands at the center of the Smith chart to create a matched load. <clears throat> and also vice versa, if this was a negative reactance, then you can imagine I'd be out here somewhere. And by adding a positive reactance, I start uh, moving this direction along the arc again towards the matched load until everything uh, becomes zero there. So I would have just a value of one, for my normalized load impedance, which would be this point here on this, um, this circle. Okay, so this is an important distinction. We have this kind of algebraic approach using pure circuit theory, but we wanna also be able to visualize things in terms of the Smith chart. So let's now move on to another special case. Okay, let's do a slight variation of that original thought experiment. I've redrawn the same situation here, only instead of in terms of impedances, we're doing it in terms of admittance. Okay, remember admittance is just one over impedance. So here is a characteristic admittance, which is one over Z naught. And let's suppose hypothetically, the admittance of my load here just so happens to almost match uh, my load or, or my, my line here, my load has it why not? The real part is matching the impedance here, but there's some extra imaginary bit, which we're gonna denote with a B for my load, uh, I guess, reactive admittance, whatever the word is for that. So we saw how before we could add something in series to create a match. So in this case, why don't we just add something in parallel, right? Because the input admittance, I'm gonna write this Y sub in, for parallel impedances is just going to be the sum of their admittances, right? So let's call this uh, JB. <clears throat> We're going to get JB plus Y naught plus JBL, where this little bit here is my load admittance. So that's how it works for uh, parallel combinations here. So hypothetically, if the real part matches, there's just this imaginary bit I need to account for. How can I correct that? Well, pretty easy, right? Because for a capacitor, remember ZC is one over J omega C. So I would write Y sub C is just J omega C. So a capacitor will have a real admittance. Uh, so those are C's. And then ZL being uh, J omega L, that means the reactive, uh, so th this is inductive, not load in this case, 
uh, would be one over j omega l, which is negative j over omega l. So you notice how there's this nice little parallelism here where a capacitor would have negative impedance but positive admittance. An inductor here, when in parallel, will result in a negative admittance as opposed to a positive impedance. So all I have to do is choose the appropriate component here to negate this imaginary value. So if this is positive, I need a negative. So that would imply I need a parallel inductor to offset that positive uh, admittance value here. Or alternatively, if this happened to be a negative sign or a negative value, then of course you would put a capacitor in there to offset it. So algebraically, again, that should kind of make sense, but let's think about this in terms of the Smith chart. And this is where I think the book kind of lets us down, right? So let's draw this again. I'm going to draw my unit circle here, like so. So you notice I'm counting four tick marks to draw a nice unit circle here. There we go. <clears throat> So we found when we're in the world of admittance, we had this circle here corresponding to a matched real component. So what the book does not quite do the best job of explaining is what happens if we look at the Smith chart in terms of admittance values instead. So it turns out you can, all the rules still apply. All you have to do is flip flop the Smith chart. All the things that were happening here on the right hand side get mirrored over to the left. So you maybe talked about that briefly in 3300. Uh, we, we sort of scratched that a little bit. <clears throat> and if we had more time, that is something that should have been emphasized, but just isn't really made clear in the textbook. Uh, so I've, we're gonna talk about that now. So because I matched the real bit here, if I then normalize it, so I'm gonna write this out as say, little y sub l. So this is my load admittance here, not the inductive. I'm gonna, it's just going to be YL divided by the characteristic admittance. You notice I get one plus J B sub L here. <clears throat> so the same rules apply. When we were in the admittance world, if I had a real value of one, it landed on this circle. When we're in the admittance realm, we flip that over to a circle here, like this. Okay, so because this value is one, I imposed that condition, just kind of advance arbitrarily. That means it has to land somewhere on this circle. That is the key. So when I match the real part of the impedance, I had maybe a value here. So if I match the real part of the admittance, I'm gonna land somewhere over here. And by adding or subtracting an imaginary component to it, you notice that same rule applies where I'll either go that way or that way along the circle, okay? <clears throat> So for example, infinite capacitance here would imply a short circuit, whereas zero capacitance would move me over this direction to just a real value here, right? Because it would act like an open circuit. So, and then, so inductance, if I had infinite inductance, uh, that should move me one direction or the other. So you gotta be a little careful with the sign conventions, uh, but the same argument is going to imply by adding some inductance or capacitance here, that is going to move my equivalent input reflection coefficient here along this circle. So again, remember, this circle represents a polar plot of my reflection coefficient. And by moving these components around, I'm moving along circles, I'm changing the equivalent input reflection coefficient here. So there'll be some gamma associated with this network and you can think of this as little knobs that you're twisting. I can either add capacitance or add inductance by twisting that knob, and it will have the effect of this little X here moving one way or the other on this circle. And of course, if I'm down here, those same knobs will either move me up this way or move me down that away. So in this case, if I have a positive admittance in my load, I want a negative <laughs> contribution from the inductor to offset it. So adding inductance in this case is going to move me closer to my matched load. So I just need to choose an inductance L here to offset or negate this little uh, 
real value over here. And of course, if it was negative, then I would add a capacitor over here to move in the, the counterclockwise direction. But the idea is to think about these little circuit components in terms of dialing a little knob that moves my my reflection coefficient one way or the other, and they're going to follow these circles. Okay, so again, I wish the book kind of emphasized this idea a little bit more. We're, we should be very comfortable with the impedance side of the Smith chart, but we don't get that much exposure to admittance. But the only thing you have to remember at the end of the day is that when I put stuff in parallel, I am going to, or if I have reactants in parallel, it moves me along these circles that are mirrored from the impedance side here. So the idea is the same. I can do this algebraic solution over here, or I can visualize it in terms of motion along these circles.